السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله أما بعد respected brothers and sisters those who are present watching listening I wanted to spend the next few moments that we have reflecting upon something that perhaps each one of us have been engaged in watching talking listening and I wanted to derive some lessons and review this and just talk about the legacy it leaves behind for us Muslims and that is the World Cup the Qatar World Cup which is coming to an end which will finish this weekend and this World Cup has faced much negativity double standards hypocrisy and at times making us think that that is this all aimed at Qatar or is this Islamophobia from the West at its peak much of course very unfair and a very small tiny nation in the Middle East and that's what I wanted to focus on Qatar's legacy on the World Cup and I don't want to talk about the football so don't ask me who I think will win the World Cup before I talk about the fantastic Dawa work the hospitality and the hosting of the World Cup I wanted to expose some of the double standards and hypocrisy that Qatar has faced as Muslims we need to educate ourselves and we need to know some facts these are not stereotypes these are facts one of the lessons is that the Qataris throughout this World Cup stayed very firm on their Islamic principles and on their cultural values they said that we are not going to change our religion or our culture for one month however everybody is welcome regardless of your race we don't discriminate everybody is welcome to our country as long as you respect our laws and values and I think generally we would all agree with that if you had guests coming to your house you would expect them to respect your house if a guest comes to your house and starts to criticize your wallpaper your curtains or physically gets up and starts making changes to your house I don't think you will take that lightly so however the West decided to mix politics with sports and decided to educate Qatar on human rights so now suddenly you got ex-footballers who've become human rights specialists and you got footballers talking about the human rights of Qatar with a passion yet struggling to read from a paper if you're passionate about something and you speak from your heart you don't need a piece of paper to read from and there are some individuals ex-footballers who are made to sit there with a piece of paper in front of them even that they're struggling to read so a lot of this hypocrisy of course has been unfair and why should the West take the moral high ground and educate Qatar do they have a clean past is their history so clean 
the very country we live in England has England forgotten its past when it colonized India stole 45 trillion pounds worth of their resources we don't have an exact number from from the academic sources we know that India murdered sorry England murdered between 1 to 10 million Indians remember this is pre Pakistan pre Bangladesh Pakistan India Bangladesh and some of the other neighboring nations this is all one India run by the Mughal Empire the Muslims has England forgotten its part in killing thousands in Iraq and Afghanistan which was an illegal war no weapons of mass destruction were found not in Iraq not in Afghanistan but what happened was they as a result killed innocent Muslims in their thousands have England forgotten their past or their involvement in the current conflict between Palestine and Israel and the part they played have the Germans who also were educating Qataris forgotten their past regarding human rights a nation which killed up to six million innocent Jews under their Nazi rule have they forgotten their past and their colonial history is littered with blood and tamed with tales of misery I'm talking about Holland here that they kidnapped thousands of slaves from Africa and they sold them to America and they stole their resources and slaughtered thousands raping women and girls Holland in South Africa Denmark and Belgium currently that was a past let's talk current present should worry about the rise of Islamophobia in their countries and likewise France which is a secular country so it's illegal there too wear a hijab and I believe also really for religious uh, reasons growing a beard don't quote me on that but I know definitely for the hijab is banned in France then we had the drama regarding the one love armband they said okay if we are not allowed to wear the rainbow armband in support of LGBT which remember the Qatari said they welcome homosexuals heterosexuals everybody's welcome just respect our law Qatar never said that homosexuals are not allowed what they said was public display of affection is not allowed in our country that's what they said meaning don't hold hands and kiss in public that's against our culture respect our culture this is something you do in secret don't show your love to the people so suddenly they said okay well if we're not gonna wear the rainbow armband we're gonna wear the one love and there were about seven nations who took part in this yet on the night before FIFA announced that any captain who wears the one love armband will be booked they will get a yellow card <clears throat> and all of these captains including our captain as well I'm not gonna mention names got frightened of a yellow card but when you have principles and morals you don't sacrifice at any level that will come first you don't sacrifice anything so if you stand for something you will stand regardless of what's coming your way you never sacrifice your morals for anything and your principle but they did they said oh yellow card well we can't wear it let me take you back to 1967 the great Muhammad Ali rahimahullah 
many of us probably don't remember. What happened back in 1967, and those who do, may Allah grant you a long life and continued age and health. So he refused to join the U.S. Army to fight the Vietnam War. And despite all of the threats that he faced, he remained firm on his principles. He was anti-war. In fact, I now quote, I read, I read, he said, my conscience won't let me go and shoot my brother or some darker people or some poor hungry people in the mud for big powerful America and shoot them for what? They never called me nigger. They never lynched me. They didn't put no dogs on me. They didn't rob me of my nationality, rape and kill my parents, shoot them for what? How can I just shoot these poor people, just take me to jail? Muhammad Ali was 25 years old, voted the greatest sports personality of all time. But look at the sacrifice he made. He wasn't scared of the consequences the reprimands he wasn't scared they were scared of a yellow card what does that show you how much loyalty you have to lgbt he was fined ten thousand pounds or dollars back from fighting again i believe for the next five years or three years rather and he was in prison for five years but he accepted that he took the fine he took the ban, he took the prison sentence. Why? Because he was firm on his usul, on his principles. He said, my religion does not allow this to go and kill innocent people. On this note, let me mention that, because we're talking about LGBT here, yeah, the last time England hosted the World Cup in 1966, when they won the World Cup, homosexuality was illegal it was a crime you were not allowed to be gay and nobody ever dare spoke about homosexuality it was a taboo and yet 50 years later they want to shove it down the throat of your children and your grandchildren confusing innocent children anyway I don't want to further dwell into this just mention some things I think we need to know educate ourselves and as I mentioned right at the beginning I want to use a few moments I have to focus on the positive notes and what Qatar has left the Islamic legacy it has left behind some people say but you know Sheikh, they spent billions on this World Cup isn't it a waste of money and I'll I'll justify it. I'll, I'll give you an answer in a few moments. I say there's a choice. This World Cup would have been hosted by England or any other country in which Muslims would have gone and non-Muslims alike and there would have been alcohol, there would have been zina and, and Muslims would have been attending that environment. That's the first thing. Secondly, on the other hand, you have a Muslim nation who's host the World Cup and yet people are going and listening to Adhan, watching Salah, being invited to Islam. The greatest Dawah project ever. Over three million people attending this World Cup in a small nation, Qatar. So would you have the former or latter? And in terms of the Islamic legacy that Qatar has left behind, it's great. And it's something that will last for years. Because already experts, football pundits, are saying that this is the greatest World Cup ever. So at the beginning of this World Cup, there was Quran recitation. Never heard before in any opening ceremony, which the BBC, by the way, boycotted. And the very people you pay 150 pounds to a year, they boycotted that ceremony. One of the greatest signs of hypocrisy 
and you subhanallah you pay them 150 pounds to show this hypocrisy boycott bbc why pay 150 pound a year for what secondly we had the emir of qatar for the first time ever we heard the name of allah bismillah rahman rahim being recited in an opening ceremony the world cup is being opened but i'm not saying it's an islamic thing but he said bismillah rahman rahim the tournament prior to its opening allah is being mentioned allah's name is being mentioned then billboards around especially around the football stadiums in which there were quranic verses in which there were hadith of the rasul prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam qr codes were put in hotels and the tents that they had for the supporters that if they could scan with their mobile phone it would take them to a number of websites and they could learn more about islam educating the people about islam they had an opportunity to promote their country to promote all of the other tourist attractions but no their primary uh, their primary uh, primary objective was to promote islam then they had special muaddins installed who came and called out the adhan throughout the day five times a day and then muslims are suddenly you know walking around the stadium and they hear the adhan they say wow what is this see the testimonies the vlogs they've left behind people saying how beautiful is it that five o'clock we're sleeping and suddenly this beautiful voice waking us up and then people were allowed to go to the masajids non-muslims were allowed to go to the masajids and and watch people praying and literally there were people who went to qatar you know named david and jack and oliver they've come back as muhammad abdul rahman abdullah hmm? they've come back taking shahada a full family from brazil took shahada as well and likewise many other places where islam is not even a minority it's a doubt it's like a mustard seed never heard of islam they don't know what islam is but they've gone to qatar they've seen and they said wow you know where have we been for all these years this is amazing prayers were led salah was led at football stadiums special exhibition centers were set up to teach people about the history of islam international scholars were invited the arts were invited to give lectures to educate the people restricting the use of alcohol and some restriction is better than nothing at all so there were some restrictions put in place so this is the legacy that Qatar has left behind and of course as Muslims we should praise them we've got enough people criticizing them so don't jump on that bandwagon by this is these are your Muslim brothers who've done an excellent job a tiny nation population of what two and a half million people who hosted such a wonderful Islamic World Cup not a football World Cup an Islamic World Cup promoting the values of Islam and in this they also supported the forgotten people the forgotten lands who are these these are the Palestinians Palestine remember I said to you at the beginning there might be some people who might criticize the Qatar spent millions on this World Cup but do we know that the Qataris are the most generous people on the planet annually every single year they give Palestine 400 million pounds 400 million pounds go to the Palestinian cause there is no other country on the face of this planet that spends more money on the Syrians hmm? Qatar there are charities institutes massages around the world in countries perhaps you've never been to never heard that have been supported by the Qataris so why this double and by the way Qatar gives us five percent of the gas as well so when you say our government is saying that boycott the World Cup don't travel to the World Cup because of the human rights we're clean we didn't kill the millions in India we didn't kill the innocent million we're millions in Iraq and Afghanistan but boycott the World Cup yet the Qataris they invest in your economy you take their gas why don't you boycott that a certain sports presenter who took up to two million pounds from them and then suddenly come the World Cup he's 
become a special human rights activist speaking out against the country. Double standards, hypocrisy, not against Qatar, against Islam, the Islamic values. And most importantly, and I'm going to finish off on why did these millions of people go and subhanAllah, okay, not all of them have embraced Islam, but their view has changed. Go and see the vlogs that people have left behind. They died with saying that, you know, we went and we thought these Muslims are going to be terrorists, yet we were greeted at the airports with flowers and dates and water. We were treated like kings. The hospitality that we have received, there were people feeding us in the car park. One person said, me and my family, we couldn't find a hotel. Some random person came, said, come on, live with us. He goes, I lived for a full week in Qatar, free of charge. I didn't pay any hotel fees. I didn't buy any food. They fed me every single day. The Prophet said, Man kana yu'minu billahi wal yawmil akhir, fal yukrim hudayfah. He said, whoever has true, firm belief in Allah and the Akhirah, he will always honor their guests. These people honored their guests, Muslim and non-Muslims alike, because this is what Islam teaches us. And based on this hadith and the hospitality they gave to these non-Muslims, as I've said, David, Barbara, Linda, subhanAllah, they've come back as Abdul Rahman and Maryam and Hannah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all guide us, give us understanding. And inshallah, we'll continue in a few moments after this. <coughs>
بسم الله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وبعد. So some of the uh, late comers uh, might be wondering who heard the last part of the khutbah that uh, we were talking about the actual football and perhaps I was predicting the World Cup final and who's going to win the World Cup final. Well, that I can't predict, but what I can say to you that before the, before the World Cup even kicked off, there was one winner. And that winner is our beautiful religion of Al-Islam. The exposure the, that, and the Islamic values, the religion that Islam has been open to and exposed to. As I mentioned, people have gone, they've seen the hospitality of the Muslims, the generosity of the Qataris, going and, you know, to masajids and watching the salah, listening to the adhan, amongst many things, the du'ats that were there promoting the religion of Islam before even the World Cup kicked off. Subhanallah, the religion of Islam has won over the hearts of many. Because Allah says, هُوَ الَّذِي أَرْسَلَ رَسُولَهُ بِالْهُدَىٰ وَدِينِ الْحَقِّ لِيُظْهِرَهُ عَلَى الدِّينِ كُلِّهِ That this religion is the truth, is, is the truth, the, the religion of truth. And it will prevail over other religions. One winner, the greatest winner of the World Cup, Al-Islam. But I can't leave without mentioning a team that perhaps we all adopted throughout the World Cup and perhaps most of us we started to support Morocco <laughs> and Morocco itself known as Maghrib left a great legacy behind perhaps like never we might never see this before a, a, a Muslim nation going to the semi-finals of a World Cup I hope this wasn't the last time but again I'm not going to focus on the football but three things are worthy of mentioning and maybe a fourth as well with the Moroccans that we learned our Muslim brothers. Remember, these are celebrities. They get paid thousands. They pay for the top clubs in Europe. Is at all time they showed gratitude to Allah. When they won, they fell into prostration of shukr. When they lost, they fell into prostration of shukr as well. And these are the pictures that were circulated around the world, people seeing the Muslims prostrating at all times. Secondly, how they honored their parents. At every victory they went up to their parents. We saw them hugging and kissing their mothers. Other footballers will show both their partners, their, their wives, who are also models and celebrities. Forgetting the very people who built their foundation. And we saw some of the Moroccan footballers that at every victory they went and they hugged their mother or father and they kissed their hands honoring their parents something sadly we have lost they are celebrities today we're sad to walk with our parents we're sad to walk side by side with our parents teenagers are scared to walk with their parents so they say to the parents you walk ahead we'll walk behind you know when we want to use sunnah we say oh but it's out of respect i don't walk ahead of ahead of my parents i just walk behind them but that's not the intention. You have, you're embarrassed of your own parents. And number three, the cause for Palestine. At every match, the fans had the flag of Palestine, sporting the forgotten brothers, the forgotten lands of Palestine. And maybe the last one, of course, is uh, the match against uh, France, which they were shouting out and, and hymning the Shahada, that there is no God except Allah. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the messenger of Allah. And we know that in these football matches, there's a lot of banter goes on and people sing a lot of, and say a lot of things that are not meant to. A lot of swearing comes out of their mouth. But in this match, alhamdulillah, throughout the match, what we were hearing from the Moroccans was La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah. On this note, I wish uh, the, the team every success. And I hope they do uh, go back to their respected lands uh, with a uh, bronze medal. As for who's going to win the World Cup, but these both teams, France, are wicked. Not wicked in the sense of wicked in the footballing sense. Are the most Islamophobic country on the face of this planet. So I hope they don't win. And Messi, he's a pro-Zionist. And we said def definitely don't want a Zionist lifting that World Cup trophy. So we can just hope and pray the match gets cancelled.